Hello again and welcome to White Chocolate Podcast. This is number 20, number 20. And I'm here with uh, somebody who's not Will. I'm Dirk, of course, but Will, again, is away on vacation. And uh, so we're, we're having a guest co-host today. So, uh, and our title today is A Baker's Dozen, which you'll find out why in just a little while. But we wanted to go ahead and put out another podcast for you this week and give you something to just sort of entertain and something you could listen from, listen to. I love when you learn stuff. I think I mentioned this last week when you kind of learn about different things. So I invited my wife's sister, Samantha. So, hey, Samantha. Hello. Um, I invited her to come and talk a little bit about what she does and experiences that she's got in life. And because she's got some really interesting things to share and some things that she Uh, deals with as a mom. And um, so I just thought it'd be an interesting topic to talk about. So I invited her in and she graciously made time um, today after just coming back herself from being out of town. So lots going on this morning. Um, I wanted to start with our segment one called Be Our Guest segment. And in this segment, it's really, sorry, I'm just going to make a little adjustment. In this segment, it's really just about um, who you are like an introduction so that people kind of have an idea. So, of course, you're my wife's younger sister. And um, where did, where were you? You're from this area originally, right? You're from the Martinsburg-ish area. Yep. And you were born here and, and, uh, because I know. I was born in Michigan. Born in Michigan. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then you guys moved here when you were. As a baby. As a baby. Mm -hmm. And then you've been here ever since. So you attended school locally and all that. And then there was a time where. Um, in high school, I know you did cheerleading and stuff like that. That was big. Will you share anything about like what, what that was like, what you enjoyed about it, what was good about it? Um, I did cheer for about nine years, um, because I did all-star before that. And then I cheered, um, in high is, school. What's all-star? Uh, travel. Is that like a, almost like what would be a rec league sports? Yeah, basically. Except for cheerleading? Yeah. Okay. Um, so instead of competing against local high schools, you're competing against other um, groups like groups yours. across the states. And it could be people from out west or up down the east coast. And what what like what was the best part or the worst part about cheerleading? Like what did what do you, if you think back about it, what did you um enjoy? It, it was family oriented, um, getting to have teammates um and friends on that kind of level um looking back though um the sport itself is very hard on your body mm -hmm. um yeah you had a broken bone at least <laughs> once right i've broken a lot of things um i have a bad back um i know i have arthritis now on my knees and my and my um, wrists and stuff from tumbling mm -hmm. from all-star you tumble on like foam mats like uh -huh. gymnastic mats mm -hmm. And then high school, it's basically the outside grass or a wooden gym floor. Yeah, the gym floor. Yeah, a high impact on your joints for <laughs> yes. sure. High impact. What was the? What did you break? What were some of your breaks? Um, I've sprained and broke both ankles, and I actually chipped the end of my left elbow off. Um, I had to wear this cast for a little bit, and then I had a brace. That had two dials, well, or two wraps, a dial, and then two more wraps. And I can only go at 90 degree angle. And I did that in eighth grade. And I was called um, Inspector Gadget's wife because yeah, everything always went wrong. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you had all these gizmos attached to you. Mm -hmm. um, what I remember some of these, and I, and I don't know all of them. And then you went on for a little while at Shepherd and you mm -hmm. cheered there. Was it any different? Was it now? And also, wait, before we get that far. There are different positions in cheer, right? Yes. And mm -hmm. so there are, can you run me through that? Because I've heard the term base, flyer. Yes. Are, are there other? So I was a base, but there's different kinds of base. So you have the main and the assist. I've done both of those. Mm -hmm. um, What's the difference between those two? Who's holding the most weight? Oh, okay, okay. Um, the main holds the most weight, and then the assist guides with that weight. You're okay. supposed to share it, but most of the time it ends up being on the main, Okay. Um, depending on what kind of stunt you're doing. And then there's a front spot which helps the, the, both of the bases and then the back spot. Um, gotcha. Everybody's supposed to split the weight, right. but it depends on the stunt on who's getting the most weight when. But, and you were on an, uh, it was all girl cheer, right? It was, it, was it a, was it a? Until um, Shepard, Shepard was co-ed. Okay, co-ed, okay. So, 
And then do do the men typically take over just from a strength point of view, the base things? Is that typically more what happens? Usually, yeah. Because I've seen like college cheer competitions on TV if you're flipping through. And yeah, um, like when they have more co-ed teams like that, most of the time the guys, they'll do like single stunts where it's the guy and then one flyer doing their own single stunts. Right. Um, but yeah, norm normally if it's a lot of co-ed, the, the men will take predominantly cool. most of that. Yeah, that's cool. I, I just... I've always noticed it. It's got to be a fearless thing, especially for the flyers. But anybody that does, like I even went, to, uh, Will, actually, his uh, brother, when he played at the high school, Dalesville High School basketball, and I would go and just watch the high school cheerleaders, and they do, like, the consecutive back handsprings, mm -hmm. maybe is what it's called, like, down across the court. I'm just like, how do you not get dizzy when you do that? Like, do you just learn to control your head? Are there tricks to doing it? Are there, like, how does that work? It's... You just you just kind of get used to you it. You get used to it. It's okay. part of the trade. So. Because to me, it seems like once you get dizzy, it would become even more dangerous. It does. There was actually um, a girl that graduated a year before me. She taught gymnastics, and she was able to do multiples, and she could spell out Hedgesville tumbling. That's crazy. Literally, H E. Like wow. she would spell it out. That's crazy. And wasn't it? I that just just popped into my head. But wasn't it um, one of the Olympic gold medals? And I know it's uh, the the girl that's local. I forget her name now. Um, not Dominique Dawes, but the Simone Biles, I mm -hmm. think. Wasn't she, when she pulled out of the Olympics, wasn't that due to something that had to do with like a, a sort of an inner ear? I mean, it was stress too, but didn't she mention something about... Something was off. An inner ear, and if you don't have your balance and you're trying to do any of those... Oh, it's dangerous. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So... Anyway, well, that's that's interesting. I just I don't know much about it, and I think probably honestly a lot of people, and I'll ask you this: Do people underestimate? I feel like people underestimate. Oh, you're just a pretty girl doing cheerleading, but I think people underestimate how tough it is. I mean, it is akin to gymnastics with tumbling. What you're doing, it's pretty much the same, right? As far as I know, Shepherd still has it labeled as a club and not a sport. Right. Even though they were required to abide by all NCAA West Virginia, rules. Yeah. Well, and I guess, I mean, I don't know how you define sport. To me, sport always is sort of, well, you compete with cheerleading. They go on a lot of competitions. Like yeah. they've done, they've actually won a lot of money. I was always going to say, to me, competition <laughs> means there's a winner and a loser. But I guess when you go to competition, you have winners and losers. So that's interesting. And then after Shepherd, you went to, your parents were in Florida at the mm -hmm. time, and you went down there and attended a cooking school, but it was specifically for, I, cooking school is probably demeaning to call it a cooking school. No, but it, a, it's, it would be labeled as a cooking school. I just... A culinary Academy, yes. right? Uh, they use the big fancy words, but it was, and we don't have to go into details, it was a pricey high-end cooking school, with, which had great um reputation yes. and and but you didn't go for the cooking side you went for the baking side correct and that was a patisserie school is that what that correct. or at least a denomination of mm -hmm. yeah very cool and so and that we'll talk about that more in the next segment but that's kind of more of what you're using today like in your in your own business and that's that's fascinating too because it, people at home gosh um, I was, I wasn't going to ask, uh, Samantha to bring anything today, but <laughs> I didn't have time. I'm telling you, she just, <laughs> it doesn't matter what it is that she makes. It is the best. My son loves everything. And that's like a gift for the family whenever we get together for a family function, because she'll always bring something delicious. Um, so that's pretty much it. And now you're a wife, a mom, and you bake your, you know, your own stuff. And we'll get into that a little bit more in a second, but um, you got married, uh, how long ago did you and Michael get married? 2015. 2015, so you got that going on, and your daughter is? Six. Six, I was gonna say five. Your daughter is six. So you Come got on that now, you're supposed on. to be uncle. I, I know, I'm supposed to know all these things. I'm so bad, you know, here's a, here's a confession I have. At work, I have many coworkers, of course, and they all have children, and I, for my good memory with a lot of things, the worst thing I have is my memory for kids' names and ages and how many kids people have. For some reason, it's a mental block. I can remember like something minuscule that happened with me and a coworker 10 years ago. But when it comes to remembering kids' names and ages, I have one coworker who's a PE teacher, and he, uh, Fernando, Will and I talk about him a lot, and he has four boys. 
And for the life of me, almost every time I forget one of them. And I, I like if I did it now, I know he has Christian. And it's a little bit easy because they're Catholic, so or his wife's Catholic, so they typically pick biblical names. But it's like Christian, Samuel, uh, Daniel, I think is the baby. He's the one I usually forget. Christian, Sammy, Daniel, Mateo. There, I remembered all four. So anyway, uh, yeah, I'm just bad with names and ages. But Kendall is now, is it okay? I can edit that out if you don't want me to use her name. Kendall's now six. Yep. And um, so, and she provides uh, a lot of joy and a lot of struggle, as all kids do. So, and we're going to talk about that a little bit later, because she was diagnosed early in life with Down syndrome. And so we're going to talk a lot about like what that means, how hard that is, what you have to do as a mom that's different. And I hope people um, find that interesting because a lot of people are lucky enough that they never have to worry about any kind of a disability in, in their family or any kind of a special needs situation. So uh, I thought it would be interesting to talk about that because I know you're a big advocate for that. And your business, Sam Sweets, mm -hmm. right? And you just kind of tell me about that. Tell me how that works. Um, so finished culinary school, um, right when the first economy crash mm -hmm. happened in 08, 09, um, I moved back up here. Um, there wasn't even much jobs happening in Florida anyways. Um, the school had to hire a lot of students to work in their restaurant because they couldn't even find jobs for the students. Cause that's, that was supposed to be the goal was the school helps provide like job the, placement. the job placement. Yeah. So like Disney wasn't, they were in a hiring freeze. Everybody was in a hiring freeze. Right. I actually had applied at the Greenbrier prior to where I got to my externship at the homestead the... and they actually ended up cutting contracts. Yeah. Um, and for those people that don't know, the Greenbrier is like a fancy five-star resort owned by the governor of West Virginia. Yes. He owns it, correct? Yes. Uh, owned by the governor of West Virginia, and it's a beautiful, ridiculous, uh, you know, hotel and resort in golf, the middle of golf, golf course. Yeah, mm -hmm. in is it in the middle of West Virginia? I don't even know where it's at. It's in White Sulphur Springs, so it's okay. southern part of the southern state. part of the state. But it's gorgeous and known for being a high end resort. And so, with your training, <coughs> pardon me, with your training that that's the place where your goal would be to land. I mean, your goal would be to land at a place that's like uber high end. Like we have a place in Shepherdstown called the Bavarian that's yeah. sort of the same thing. They're, they build themselves as a, what, Austrian inn or, or German, German inn. And so, you know, that's the kind of place where you're trained to work. Like we're not talking about, you know, we're opening your own bakery shop if that were in the works or whatever. But I mean, we're talking high end, fancy, you know how to do like the stuff that you'd get if you went to a fancy DC restaurant. Right. I mean, that's your specialty. Right. Um, and luckily for us, you know, we have family get togethers. So, <laughs> so the fact that you know how to do all that, and that kind of bridges the gap into what I wanted to talk about in segment two, which was more specifically your business and how you got started and what kinds of things you like to make. And just like, that's something I think, Besides being a necessity for income, it's something that you enjoy doing, obviously. Right. So tell me like how that got started or what you got an idea or why it started, all that kind of stuff. Kendall actually played a part in that. <clears throat> um, without her, I don't think I would be where I'm at with my business. Um, because after I had finished schooling and I did my externship and I worked through the economy crash, there was nobody that was hiring. There was no jobs locally that were going to either pay me what I should have been paid um, or there was just no jobs in general in the field. Um, so trying to find a job in D.C. or Arlington, Baltimore was next year impossible. Which is, and even that's an hour and a half from here. Right. And also, I mean, I know there was a time when it was so tough, like you had to take what you could find. That's this right. This was before Kendall. Right. And here you were you know, with this fancy training and degree, but you were basically working at a local restaurant. I worked at Ryan's. Yeah. Which was, for those like, of you that are not local, it's like a, a, a buffet, buffet, golden, golden corral. corral. Yeah. 
And so, and you were in charge of the dessert bar, but that was hardly tapping the skill that oh, you had barely. because it was like, you know, can you push buttons on a microwave yeah. and defrost this pie kind <clears> of a thing, but it didn't give you a chance to be creative. No, um, I did have the possibility of getting a little creative. I went down to Berkeley Springs at the country and I was only there for a couple months. Um, poor management skills there, um, but it wasn't just me with the issue. It was a whole business operation mm -hmm. issue. I left there and ended up at the racetrack, which was a great experience overall. Um, but when you're dealing with a casino and Penn National, it, it's no different than dealing with a corporate. They have several corporate locations across the United States. So you don't have the ability of being creative. It's whatever they want on their menu and you're following that specific list. Right. I did desserts for the Skybox when it was there. It's no longer there now. Um, it's under a different restaurant now. Um, I did desserts for the um, Skybox. While you're thinking, um, I was just going to add for people that don't <clears throat> know our area, the the racetrack was Charlestown Racetrack. Right. And it's a horse racetrack and an off-site betting for track betting, but it also has a full casino there. So kind of a resort. I mean, it, not a resort, but a destination. People come there to bet. To, before gambling was legal in a lot of yeah. other states, that was a place they could come. Yeah. Um, I did desserts for the Final Cut. Final Cut is still there. Um, I couldn't, you had to do what was on their menu. You couldn't experiment and do your own things. I was able to do a little bit of that when I was at the one in Berkeley Springs. But when you go through under a corporation, it's their menu, their rules, um, which was fine. Um, and but... Berkeley Springs, again, for people, that's sort of a weird, it's, uh, Berkeley Springs is kind of an enigma. It's a small town here in West Virginia, but it's also a destination it's spot. It's historic. People like going there. Um, there's a lot of artistic stuff. There's big festivals, different times of the year, the Maple Syrup Festival, I know they have. They have all kinds of fall festivals. The Apple Butter so, Festival. Yeah, and it's also, they're known for like their spas and well springs and supposedly historically, you know, famous people went there. And so it's kind of a weird place because 90% of the time, it's just a small country town, but mm. when they're having their big functions, it's, you bring people from DC all, all the way over. up here and mm -hmm. people know that. So. That would make sense. They have some fancy places up there because, you know, but, but so you're saying the freedom, the freedom that you got when you, or the freedom that you would have if you were working at some place that was your own or a fancy restaurant that trusted you to use your professional training to like come up with desserts, come up with ideas. None of that could happen when you were working no. in a place that's just like, just crank out the same thing over it, and over. It is. And, um, it was fine then with, you know, when I'm in my early 20s, working nights, weekends, holidays, not really caring, but working because I enjoyed the job. But it got to the point where I wasn't enjoying the job anymore. Right. And being so fresh out of culinary school, I didn't expect the burnout to be so early. And I wasn't getting paid what I should have. And in today's economy, I mean, making that would have been phenomenal. But well, they, I, weren't, they weren't paying you. <clears throat> They were paying you what they should have based on what they were asking you to do, but they weren't paying you what you could have done if they were allowing you. In other words, if you just want somebody to heat up frozen dessert, right. you're going to pay them eight bucks an hour right. back in the day. But if you want somebody to create desserts that are beautiful on a five-star level, then you're obviously going to have to pay for that skill. Correct. So the problem was they were paying you what you were doing for them was was right but not what you were capable of doing correct. and what you were trained to do correct so and what are some things because our audience i know will if he was here would be enjoying this but uh just to make him jealous when he watches this at home <clears throat> describe some of the things that you like to make or some of the things that you do and what makes what you do better than you know 90 percent of what people taste for desserts so i consider myself um I guess I like get jack of all trades. Um, I don't just do one specialty. I like to do several things. There are things that I don't do, and it's mainly because of Kendall, because of time management. So I don't do any fondant stuff. I don't have time for it. It's very tedious and time consuming. And what is fondant? I mean, um, I know, but describe it for people uh, that Basically, the, the fancy white layer that goes on um, wedding cakes or extravagant cakes that has like a firm finish 
Um, and and they, they, you can do like pieces and design. Yeah, and... you can cut it out kind of like Play-Doh in a okay. way and design it. And it when it dries, it's hard. Okay. Um, but you can still cut into it. It's still edible. It's just not doesn't taste very good tasty. it just makes cakes look pretty gotcha um and it costs a lot of money i got you. um so i don't do any of those i don't do like cake pops or the fancy royal icing cookies that you would get for like bridal showers or baby showers and stuff and again you don't do it not because <clears throat> you don't know how because all this was it's just because a cooking out of your kitchen right there's a limitation to you're also being a mom full-time right and you're also you know people want a beautiful birthday cake but if they want one with fondant and all that and all their fancy stuff, they it would be a hundred and twenty five dollar cake, and they're not well, yeah, yeah. And so they go, okay, well, I want a nice cake, but I don't want that nice of a cake. Right. So you kind of have to. Is it frustrating to not do those things when you know how, or are you just as happy doing the kinds of things that people want you to do, or I'm... do you get a lot of? I want a cake, a custom cake for my baby's second birthday, and you go, okay, it'll be sixty bucks because it's expensive, and you make everything from scratch, and you do. It. And then they go, oh, well, do you have one for like 30? Like, do you get a lot of that? Um, if there, Yes, there are times. And you go like, if you want a $30 cake, go to Sam's. Sometimes like, I have to explain um, inflation and explain right. how. And eggs, for example. Ingre- well, yeah. yeah, yeah, when eggs like jump to like four or five dollars yeah. a dozen. Um, butter's still a little high. Um, but there are people that do just cakes there are people that just do wedding cakes there are people just do cupcakes in fact there's um one business locally that just does cheesecake i know there's another place in inwood that does cheesecake you have certain people across the panhandle that specialize in one thing or one or two things i do a little bit of everything so um pastries would be like turnovers um apple dumplings um i could do individual apple crisps if you wanted to keep keep let your mouth water will keep all you people out there listening because let me tell you i've had a assortment of things sam makes and pumpkin rolls amazing. pumpkin rolls i love the pumpkin rolls but you know what your cakes here's here's what and and sorry to interrupt your train of thought but here's what i love the most i am a big fan of the I don't know how you describe it in your terms, but the, that coarse buttercream frosting, okay, as opposed to like, we always have this fight in your family the because gritty. your brother hates the gritty. He likes the sort of whipped cream top here, guys at home, I'm doing this again. Uh, he loves the whipped cream type frosting where it's lighter, almost like a cool whip icing. I like the kind that's more like the powdered sugar milk combination where it's, it's got that grit to it. I can't stop doing that. I'm going to sit on my hands. Um, what is that? Is that a buttercream frosting? It's, it's buttercream. There's actually different kinds of buttercreams. Um, traditional American buttercream is butter, um, vanilla, powdered sugar, maybe some salt to tame out the sweetness, and heavy cream or some type of cream. Um, the whipped. Um, I get asked for that um, because why the, it's terrible. Well, the, because the stores <laughs> the stores offer it, so they think because That's I'm what a it's baker. Supposed to be. That I would offer that. And uh, frankly, I've told people, I don't know what whipped is. I don't. You want to know why? Because it comes in a bucket. Gotcha. I don't, I don't know what consists of whipped. So I'm assuming it's Crisco. You're, what you're saying is that my taste is higher class than your brother's. Yes. Okay. There you go. Eat that one, Art. <laughs> All right. So anyway, um, but so when you make your cakes, back to what I was asking you before, when you make your cakes, you explain to people like they want a, they want a $70 cake, but they want to pay $20 for it. How do you sort of meet them in the middle or reconcile um so i never want to lose business so if budget is is a factor um i have no problem i, I guess offering Trying a discount people where they are right i try to be i actually i get told you've even said this yourself where i undercharge um because i try to stay competitive where i'm more than walmart or martin's but I'm not as expensive as a bakery because if people are going to pay bakery prices then they're just going to go to a bakery. Right. So I try to stay in the medium and find a happy medium somewhere where I'm still competitive because I'm providing a better quality, but I'm staying more on the lower end. So I'm still getting the business. And you'll even, I mean, I know you, you 
depending on where it is. But I mean, you even deliver or meet people like it's not just, I mean, you try to get them to come to you, I yes. assume. Mm -hmm. But, you know, there was a time if you're not still doing that, but there was a time where you were, hey, I'll meet you here. Or yeah. I'll bring it to you or whatever. But you'll do what people want too. You'll, I mean, you'll do cupcakes. Yep. You'll do like your pumpkin rolls are amazing. And Sammy was making these big pumpkin rolls and you were selling them for 10 or 12 dollars 10 at first and i was like you gotta charge 15 or i mean these are easily worth that because everything is made from scratch and pardon me much like when my sister cooks and she uses one of the things that makes my sister's food really really good is she'll use fresh spices instead of just jarred spice right. like she'll go out and trim off some from the plant and grind it up and use right. it and the difference between a piece of cake that is frozen or in a bucket like you say and then they just smear it and the quality when you taste it and you just the 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 texture of the cake is so different the texture of the icing is so different and your icing is not it's almost less sweet than what you get in like a martin's or whatever yeah. mm -hmm. because there's but there's more flavor even in the icing it's like it's not just smear it with a bunch of sugar paste it's literally got a great flavor and that berry cake, I think, was the last thing that we got from you or you made for, I forget what was up. Shannon bought it. Maybe it was for my birthday. Yeah, it was for your birthday. Oh, my goodness gracious. And you use fresh raspberries and fresh strawberries or blueberries or whatever's on the top. And when you use fresh ingredients, it's absolutely so much better than anything you can ever get. Well, the compote, so if anything requires fruit, um, whether it's in season or not, um, if it's not in season, then I'll get the frozen and then thaw it out and make compote that way. But I always try to use fresh. And is compote just the so the fruit sauce sort um, of fruit? Yeah, basically it's like a, a fruit jelly. sauce. So okay. um, you just cook down the fruit um, and there's other ingredients, but I'm not going to give away my secret. Mm -hmm. um, and you cook it down and then um, like for raspberries, you don't want all the seeds. So then you have to string the seeds and then. So you just sort of press them and strain mm -hmm. it, okay? Yeah, um, it's called a sieve, but or a strainer. Same same way, I think. Was it? What, it's like a cone. My, yeah, something mm -hmm. my mom had when I was little was like a stainless steel. What would I don't know if the apple? What would you? I remember using like a wooden pestle almost, yeah. and you kind of like. Did she use cheesecloth on the inside? I don't remember cheesecloth, but I remember doing something with that. I don't remember what the heck we were making, but well, anyway, that's really that's really cool. What else? Like if you, you mentioned this earlier and I thought it was interesting. You said that you might not have started the business because if, if not for Kendall. Right. And of course, the idea here is that with Kendall's special needs, you wanted to be home with her as opposed to going back to work full time. Right. And provide her with all the things she needed, <clears throat> which we'll talk about in the next segment. But the cool part was it gave you the chance to, hey, I'm home anyway. And when she's taking a nap or when she's watching a show or when she's occupying herself, I can go out in the kitchen and get a lot done. So what do you think if you had a if you had the vision of of what you might have done if she were just went to daycare like, you know, an average kid or just went to, you know, school like an average what would your what do you think you would have tried to do instead? Honestly, I don't know. Yeah. I, I I don't know the answer to that because um I had left the corporate world because I left. I did leave baking for a period of time because I got the burnout and I switched jobs. I was still in customer service. But I've done customer service since I turned 16. Um, so I went to a different kind of job position and tried something new and that didn't work out. And then when we found out about her prenatally, everything between the pregnancy and past that was kind of up in the air. I didn't know what we were doing. And then after she was born, um some people don't have the choice um and i'm i'm grateful that we at least had the opportunity to allow me to stay home mm -hmm. um we obviously had to cut a lot of finances to afford that but we course, were still able yeah. to afford it and you know we did the same thing like um my son i've never mentioned but my son who was on last week's show um was mildly autistic or is mildly i guess it's not something that ever goes away and he when he was young, didn't talk at the normal age, didn't do a lot of things, had some social, you wouldn't know it now, but my wife was able to stay home. And that is, that was the biggest key. And it was great for you to be able to be there for Kendall and help her, which again, we're going to talk about in the next segment, all the things that she kind of needed. Right. So, 
Very, I, um, very good. I, uh, I just wanted to make sure that I wanted, I knew I needed to do something work wise. Mm -hmm. Um, and him and I had talked about it and I, him being Michael, your yes. husband, um, who's, I, who works at the Coast Guard Air Base. He's a, he's an aircraft mechanic. Right. Uh -huh. So, um, we had a discussion, um, because of finances, we were trying to figure out like the best route, what we needed to do. And, um, I didn't feel it was the best fit. For me to go back to work full time mm -hmm. um so i started to slowly because i was baking out of the house like mm -hmm. we we still have family dinners so right. i'm still providing yeah. stuff i would bake for potlucks at work so i just kind of yeah jumped hey, elbow deep this. into yeah. doing the business at that point absolutely in time. all right so we we prepared or you prepared i asked you to prepare 10 questions for me <laughs> you said you made them easy so it's going to make them it's going to make me look really dumb here's my goal my goal is to get at least five out of 10 correct. You're the judge. These are baking questions, this questions about baking or cooking or whatever you decided, but I said make them something about baking. And so we're gonna, we're gonna Sam's gonna give me um, <laughs> 10 questions. We're gonna keep track of how many I get right. So go ahead, fire away. Recipe calls for buttermilk, but you don't have any, and you don't have time to run to the store. Now what, what do you substitute? How do you make buttermilk then? Well, the obvious question, the obvious answer would be to combine butter and milk, but I wonder, buttermilk is kind of like sour milk, mm -hmm. so I don't know, do you, could you use regular milk with, um, I, I wouldn't say spoiled, I don't know. All right, here's my answer. You take, oh, but you don't have time to run, but you need it now, so you can't, you can't just wait around for your milk to spoil. You so, can, you can, it's a short marinade. You can have a short marinated milk, yes. I don't know what that means. So you, you can create spoiled it? milk very quickly. Yes. Oh, you can? Yes. So that's what I would say you do. Okay, how do you make that spoiled milk? You, is this a separate question? No, it's a, um, if you don't have buttermilk. You, you, you put a little lemon juice in the milk and then you cook it on, you cook it over a low heat until it curdles. Um, close, but no. Okay. Um, you, can, you can use lemon juice. Okay, really? Or um, white vinegar. Okay. Um, basically you, and you consider this folks do you think this is an easy question i don't think that's easy i feel like that's, a, I feel like that's an easy question okay fine you know what fine. if you don't have butter milk it. how do you create sour milk and it would be i guessed with lemon juice lemon and that juice wasn't bad or um white vinegar and okay. like a cup of milk you regular just milk. mix it or do you have to heat it too no just you just put it in measure like a cup and then do like i don't know like a tablespoon or two of lemon juice or um, white vinegar and just let it set. Now, is buttermilk is the kind you could, some people drink it or yeah, you don't usually? Okay, okay. so okay. literally you could take the lemon juice, put it in the milk and make your own buttermilk at home. Maybe I'll start a home business creating buttermilk. All right, that's one wrong. Question two. <clears throat> um, your wife should know this by now. All right, we'll see. Why should you chill your cookie dough before baking your cookies? Oh my goodness, why should you chill your cookie dough before you bake your cookies? Uh, it helps. There's no yeast in cookie dough, uh, so I'm not going to go with that. It helps to think about butter. Think about the. Okay, so it helps to keep your cookies moist, so that the butter doesn't. It helps keep your cookies moist, so that the butter doesn't render or melt too fast and leak out of the cookie. <laughs> I don't know. Too wrong. <laughs> Too wrong. So, Audience, I hope you enjoy. It. Okay. Think okay. About the so butter. when it solidifies the butter more. Right. Okay. So most you should start with room temperature ingredients because then you're able to fully incorporate all your ingredients. And they'll better. mix better. They mix better. Okay. Okay. Which some people don't understand. Well, why do I let it go to room temperature and then have to chill it? Well, you chill it because it solidifies that fat then. Okay. So, and she didn't understand this at first. So I explained to her, I'm like, okay, well, if you've already had butter that sat out all day, okay, mm -hmm. and it's come to room temp, right. and then you mix it, and then you immediately put that dough mm -hmm. into the oven, what do you get? Flat cookies. I'm like, right. So if you oh because it, it just thins out it's it, the the butters are that's already, what I said it kind of melts out right it, well will you give me a yes or no on I'll that? give you like a half a point oh half okay so that's a half I gotta keep track of halves now all right question three what is the final step before baking that allows a dough to rise so think of bread dough kneading or letting it rise 
putting wrapping it in wax paper and putting it in your refrigerator so it can rise. But you need it. You have to wait for it. What is the final step before baking? Oh gosh, putting it on the pan. <laughs> um, final. Step okay. What is, what is another term for the dough rising? Um, I'm thinking of an inappropriate term for things that rise. All right, um, dough rising. It is. It is. I don't know. The final step before baking that allows the dough to rise. So you know. you mix it, yep. you knead it, uh -huh. and then it's got to rest. What is what is that resting term? I thought resting was it. I don't know. It's called proofing. Oh, proofing. Mm -hmm. Okay, I didn't know that. That's three wrong. <laughs> the over I'm really three. trying to make it easy. Well, easy for you. You're a trained okay. patisserie well, chef. Okay. Well, so for you better get number four right because okay, you've already said it once. Okay. All okay. Right, let's try it. What is the French name for a pastry chef? Patisserie. That's right. All right. Look at that. I'm one. 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 One <clears> and three. <throat> one and three. All right. Three. Three and ones. That count. <laughs> Which of, this one is a um, multiple choice. Okay. okay. All right. Which of these cakes does not include egg yolks? Does not. Okay. Carrot cake, angel food cake, cupcakes, or a uh, genoise cake? <clears throat> I've never even heard of a genoise cake, but I'm going to go with the angel food because I think, or wait, maybe that's the one that's only egg whites. Because your mom can't eat. Does not include right. yolks. Oh, yolks. So, oh, so it would be only egg whites. Right. Then I'll go with angel food. There you go. Okay, so I'm three and two. Full count. For you baseball fans. Speaking of which, I forgot to even ask you about that. And you just took a trip up to Cooperstown okay. with your we'll come back to Yeah. It. All right, three and two. I'm I'm I, I need three more to win. All right, let's go. The pattern of a crisscrossing on a pastry on the top of a pie is called what? I've heard this term before. I know I have. Um it's strips of dough. Yeah. Is it hatching? Cross hatching no. or Oh, okay. Got that one wrong. Let's lattice. See. Lattice. Okay. So just like on my deck, it's the same. I should have guessed that. I thought hatching was something cross hatching or cross. Maybe that's when you're drawing. All right. Four wrong, two right. I'm, I'm screwed. All right. Go ahead. In Question the process seven. of cake baking, which of the following is not a raising agent? Okay. Steam, yeast, powdered sugar, or baking powder? Powdered sugar. Correct. Okay. All the other things I know raise. Okay, I'm four and three. I got a chance. You're telling me there's a chance. <laughs> Don't laugh. If I ask you music questions, you'd mess them up. All right, come on. What baking technique breaks up lumps in a flour to get more accurate measurement? Sifting. Correct. Four and four. I'm four and four, baby. I got two chances. All right, come on. Uh, you know why I know that? My mom, when I was little, uh, was it is it powdered sugar you typically do that too, or what? you do it with any, or for regular flour? My mom had a little silver. Mom, you remember this, I'm sure. About this tall and about this big, and it had a handle and a little crank yep. on the side. Mm -hmm. And she'd put, she'd say, "Okay, when we make cookies and cakes together." When I was little, I used to love making cakes with my mom. She'd say, "Okay, you sift," and my job was to sit there and crank yep. this thing like an old telephone yep. until all the flat. And it makes it just like super fine. Yep. Okay. It had like a metal ring that ground against a screen. Yep. That's all. Are the new ones different? The than new that? ones are just it's it's like shaped like a bowl essentially. Okay. With a handle. So kind of the can it. where underneath the camera mm -hmm. has like that grate yeah. that it falls through. Yeah. They just made that grate like a bowl. Oh, okay. okay. With a handle. Oh, so the whole it grinds the whole time. So Almost you just like a, you just basically dump it in the hole and just shake the thing. Oh, and it okay. Comes right out. Okay, that's cool. Mom, you you helped me get one right. All right, here we go. Four and four. Question nine. One stick of butter equals to how many cups? Okay. I know it's eight tablespoons. Do I get do I get do I get credit for that? I don't know. Ah, cups. One cup of butter. How much? Okay, now I just have to do one some stick. Cup. One stick. How many cups? How many cups of butter? Okay, uh, so if there's no, don't help. Don't okay. help. We'll right. say that's cheating. I appreciate your help though. Um, <clears throat> I have to get it or lose it on my own. I'm gonna say one cup. Half cup. Dang it! I thought maybe it would be less. 
So that's five wrong, four right. I got to get this one if I'm going to win. Okay, go ahead. This is drama. This is serious. I'm, I'm going I'm to give you, because I, no, I, I provided additional points okay. just in case, but. Don't cheat. Don't cheat for me. You don't, me. so you don't. You don't want to, I mean, I'll help you Don't win. give me a hard or an easy. No, I don't need, I don't, I don't, if, Will doesn't count it. If, if you help me cheat, he won't count it as a win. So here's the thing. Just give me like whatever one you were going to give me. Don't, don't, I mean, don't sugarcoat it, but don't pick a hard one or an easy one. Just give me whatever's next in line or whatever. Well, doing. if you, the next one you'll definitely get. Okay. Well, whatever was next in line. That's the one I want. How many is in a baker's dozen? 13. There you go. All right, baby. I got five out of 10. Yeah, that's a big win for me. <laughs> I had like a couple extra that I was going to ask just in case because I wanted to see like... Do you know why a baker's dozen's 13? Was it just something the baker did to be nice? Yeah. Throwing an extra... Okay. I, yeah, baker's dozen I knew. All right. Very good. Well, there we go. I managed to win a game of Faux Shizzle My Quizzle. Uh, <coughs> baker's edition. So there you, Some of those first ones were interesting. Like I didn't know them, but I didn't care, but it was still interesting to learn. Uh, let's move on to segment three. Uh, this one is uh, Chalk Talk, and Chalk Talk is anytime we have a serious conversation. And I wanted to take just like 10 or 12 minutes and talk about um, Kendall mm -hmm. and Down syndrome and what people don't know. Because like me, when I first became a teacher, I looked at students who had different conditions, whether it was Down syndrome or cerebral palsy or learning disability. And I'll be very honest, it sounds so terrible to say this, but they scared me because I didn't know how to treat them. Right. And if you're not familiar with these disabilities, special needs, whatever you want to call them, it's very easy to just shy away from them because you want to avoid. You don't know See, what know. to say or what to do, uh, which is also true as parents of kids with special needs. I know people would shy away from my son when he was little because he acted a little different. and um, and autism is not visible like Down syndrome is. You know, when you notice Kendall, you can see things in her that people recognize right away. So that's probably good and bad because people prejudge, but yep. also, you know, it lets people know, you know, different things. But what, I don't even know how to start the segment except to say, what is it, I guess? What is Down syndrome? It's how just does it a chromo chromosome disorder of having um, chromosome 21. So there's an extra copy of that chromosome. Um, there's actually three types. I didn't know there was three types of Down syndrome until we got pregnant. I didn't know until you just said it. Oh, so. I didn't know that. No, I didn't. Oh. Um, well, you're going to get educated. Yeah. That's why you're here. <clears throat> so there's basic trisomy 21 where it's just the third extra copy. And what happens with that is each of the cells within the body has that third extra chromosome. Um, there's also translocation, and that's what Kendall has. Um, where the extra chromosome attaches to another chromosome. Um, and I can explain that in a minute. And then there's mosaic where some of the cells with the 21 are intertwined and some of them are not. So not all the cells have them, some of them do. Um, and the mosaic is about one to two percent of the down syndrome population and the translocation is like three to four so we fall like in the rare and we're the rarest of rares because she has robertsonian transate translocation 1521 and what that means is her 21st chromosome is attached to number 15 and um, we figured that out with genetic testing um, and with us doing our carrier types as well because we found out michael is a carrier Mm -hmm. um, translocation is the only one that risks the chance of um, infertility or um, a carrier situation. Mm -hmm. um, they don't know why. Sometimes it just happens at random. Sometimes there is a family history. We're unaware of any family history. Mm -hmm. um, so we don't know if it was just something a blurb that happened at conception mm -hmm. with him. Um, and he ended up being a typical person that was balanced. So his chromosomes ended up being balanced, but then when we recreated, mm -hmm. they split, and that's how she got that extra right. chromosome. And they don't know a cause per se, no. right? No, we it's don't. There's just sort of a random. Just random, and honestly, um, being within the community, because everybody talks about age. Right. Um, but you guys were young. Right. Technically, geriatric age now is mine age, right. so I'm gonna be 36, and right. they consider that geriatric age now. 
Um, you mean as far as pregnancy goes? Right. Right. So they, when we grew up, it was like women that were like over 40. Right. The, the, right. the higher age you are, right. the risk of um, yeah. complications, complications and, and yeah. stuff like that. But in reality, thanks to social media, see, people don't think it's as common as it is. Because when we grew up, we didn't have like social media. There, right. It was. What is the commonality? One in how many? One roughly? in seven hundred. Okay. And um, it a lot of it is those who are in their twenties, early thirties. Mm. When they have their kids, you yes. Know, the parents are. Yeah, and it happens at random. So um, you can have three or four kids that are typical, and then have your kid with a disability, and then have five more kids if you want. Um, it all depends on what happens at conception i mean they they still to this day don't know what causes it it just happens at random and the only one that doesn't is if you're dealing with a trans translocation situation and not all translocations um end up being a carrier situation you would just have to do karyotype blood work just to confirm what what are common characteristics of children with down syndrome so what was interesting about her was she didn't have any markers in utero. Um, normally, like the nasal bone isn't visible. Um, sometimes they, she does have a smaller bridge, so hers doesn't come out all the way. It's just a smaller, like little mm. button nose. Mm -hmm, she does. Yeah. Um, they have what they call like a, a sandals toe gap, where basically the big toe and your first toe, there's like a big gap between that. Mm. Um, there's the Palmer's crease where instead of having like the three lines that we have, they mm -hmm. just have two across. Huh. She has normal, um, okay. Palms. Palms. Yeah. I don't want to sound offensive, but that's what it is. Yeah. Um, so, so she doesn't have the Palmer's crease. The Palmer's okay. crease is just two lines across. Um, sometimes they have like the nuchal fold in the back where it's basically the extra skin. Okay. They're able to track that, um, in utero because okay. with measurements and stuff, she doesn't have that. Yeah. Um, so a lot of the physical maladies or characteristics, for lack of a better term, she, are absent on her. Right. Yeah. She has the almond-shaped eyes. You can mm -hmm. obviously tell that she has the disability within right. her face. But that's the thing is like most of the time people think that when they have the disability, they have everything that comes with it. So like autism is not a, a one size fits all. Right, exactly. Down syndrome is the same way. Yeah, many, many <clears throat> levels and care. And by the way, if you're comfortable um, when you're done, when we're done all this, send me some pictures and I can put them up with Kendall because she's absolutely adorable. No, that's fine. Um, she's a sweetheart. <clears throat> um, uh, what are the most common misconceptions that you find people have besides just underestimating her, um, which people do, I think, with anybody with a special needs, anybody who's obviously special. You see it even in teaching sometimes. Teachers will talk down to the kids or they'll talk to, you know, what are the most common misconceptions would you say that people have about children with Down syndrome? Um, well, that's the biggest one that they can never or will never um as long as the child has provided the tools and resources to them they can do anything that a typical child can so it's just maybe at a slower rate mm -hmm. um and there's nothing wrong with that um each typical child grows and develops at their own rate and so does a child with a disability and because it's not a one size fits all she's not going to be looked upon the same way as another child with down syndrome because she has her own growth that she's going to do her own yeah. strength and weaknesses um but the the biggest thing is that they're a burden to society and um as a misconception just to be clear yes yeah you don't uh, believe that no You're no saying, that's, that's, a that's what yeah. that's like the biggest thing is that i, I could see people at home misunderstanding going she thinks her child is a burden. Oh, that? no but that's that's one of the misconceptions is that they're useless or that they're oh god now we have this this kid to deal with or we have and and as a teacher i will say that any special any any child this is going to sound terrible but it's honest and this is what you run into a lot, which I want to talk about too. As a teacher who's responsible for 30 or 40 kids at a time, you look at it and you go, man, anybody that requires something out of the average is a big stressor for a teacher right. because there are legal ramifications and you go, I have to, and, and besides, I want to say this on behalf of teachers, most teachers love kids and they love all the kids and they want to help all the kids, but there's a great guilt I know this from, oh God, it breaks my heart. I know this from talking with teachers at my school 
when they have a class of 35 kids, say, in health. But because it's PE related, they don't get a paraeducator. And so they might have six or seven kids in there with IEPs, which for people that don't know are individual education plans. And they can't meet all the requirements. It might be a requirement where a child gets a test read to them or a child gets a one-on-one -on -one interpreter or, and they can't meet those requirements because they're literally in a room with 35 kids. And so there's no way they can go and sit down with five kids and give them all of the uh, accommodations that they're supposed to get legally. I don't know how we don't get sued more often <laughs> because they don't provide, but then they'll say, well, there's no budget for special ed assistance in non core classes. So for electives like art, I, I had the only time I've ever had anybody in my room as a shadow was when I had a student that was severely autistic. Along the lines, if people have seen the movie Rain Man, he mm. was he was like Dustin Hoffman's character in Rain Man, and and he had a, a shadow that sat next to him and helped him the whole time. But the the number one thing that makes me frustrated, and I know it does you because we've talked about this, is what do you mean you don't have the money to provide the resources? And I understand that yes, we're a huge system. We're trying to provide for 120,000 students in Montgomery County, but that's not a good answer when you're the parent. No. And I know you've run into situations like that without details. And this is not meant to be a hate session, but just so that people who don't have the experience of having a special needs child, what are some of the things you've had to deal with through the education system that are frustrating or that need to be adjusted or changed? And I know this is a touchy subject because you're going through a lot of stuff, but I wanted to ask because I don't think people realize what you have to go through. Um, thankfully, we, we haven't hit too much of an issue. Um, we had some minor stuff um, this past school year, um, but we're officially hitting the school system this year with kindergarten. But um, we, I had to do some advocacy in pre-K. Um, you said advocacy? Yes. Yeah. Um, having to make amendments to the IEP, and that's just basically... Um, that's the best way to explain that. Um, making an, alter, an alteration to the IEP yeah. to fit. Well, as, as a child develops their skills, because like you say, they develop at a different pace. Um, <clears throat> when a child doesn't meet or does meet a level, then it's appropriate to change the IEP to now set the new goal. So amending, the, amending basically to suit their new needs. <clears throat> right. You never know when they're going to hit that benchmark. So um, there's constant adjustments needed in IEPs. I had to um, I've had to learn very early on that do not start a fire unless you feel it's deemed necessary. And I unfortunately had to eat a lot of stuff this year um, to make sure when we start fresh this school year, I'm not hot on the radar. I'm actually under the radar. Um, Kendall was unfortunately involved in a verbal abuse case within Berkeley County Schools, and I had to advocate on a level of making sure that she was protected because personnel were not providing information. I understand there's legality with that, but as a parent, you're not going to tell me that my child was involved in something and then not tell me anything else on how you're going to protect her going forward. Yeah, I get that a lot with, even as on the teacher's side, when a parent has a kid who gets into a fight with them and they want to, well, what happened? What? And this isn't a situation of abuse necessarily what I'm talking about. But it's like the school, all of a sudden the school is clamming up. Right. And I'm like, no, 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 no. This is my child. I'm entrusting them to you. Correct. There should be some legal rights I have to Correct. make sure that I know what is going on in your building at all times. Correct. Like I could walk in there at any time. So why why is it a secret? Oh, well, we can't talk to you about what happened with the other kid. And in this case, with a staff member, it 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 is something that they they're just so paranoid. And this is this is what my wife said. What you just said was brilliant. And I think I wish a lot of parents would hear what you say, whether it's regards to a special needs child or not. Pick your battles mm -hmm. because I, and I had to say this with my wife, because with Logan, there were things that we had to fight for. Uh, and I said, if you go in there and breathe fire every single time, there's a little problem. You are going to be seen as that parent, yeah. that yeah. mom. And then they're not going to listen to anything you say. That's right. So, and I think, but, but it, you have to resist. It's kind of like, 
I love analogies. It's kind of like when you're sliding on the ice, the worst thing you can do is slam on the brakes. Right. But as a parent, the number one thing you want to do is fight for your child. And so it's so, it puts you in such a difficult position. Being a teacher, it's helped me with raising Logan when we had to go in and fight to know the terms and the whatever. And I know there's been times where we've talked and I'm like, right. this is what, you know, something that you need to ask for or they're required to do this. But school systems like to act like they're telling you. Oh, yeah. And that's not how it works. No. You are, you are, they are your workers. You are not their workers. I've and had to educate people on that because, I mean, no offense, while they're trying to provide like a good education for your child, they don't run what happens with your child. You right. run with what that's happens correct. with your child. I've had to tell your sister <clears throat> that multiple times. You're in charge. You are, that is your child, you are in charge. And I think a lot of parents don't realize that they can and should advocate for their, they're intimidated by the education system. Yeah, I don't system. know why they're afraid of. Well, but you grew up, you grew up being raised to be bold. Uh, and I don't mean that in a joking way. Your mom's a strong person. Your dad was a strong person. So you grew up speaking your mind and not, I think a lot of people, and especially where I am, people that are from other countries, especially, because I have a lot of kids that come from, Parents, maybe they don't speak English really well, or maybe they're, and so they're kind of afraid of this big monster government machine of the school board, you know, they, the principal, well, and it comes from, they come from a culture where you respect people that are in that position, teachers are to be, so they don't challenge anything, but there are so many times where kids lose because their parents aren't willing to challenge. But on the other extreme, like you were saying, there's plenty of times where kids lose because if you go in there and throw a fireball every, over the fact that Kendall's pencil got lost right. and you don't know where it is, then it's like the boy who cried wolf. They don't know. They're going to just, oh, that's that Kendall's mom again. Don't worry about her. She's a nut. And once you get that on your, on your reputation, they're not going to listen to anything, even if it is serious. Right. I had to. I think that was part of the, the hardest thing that I had to accept this past year because we had such a very, even through COVID, we had a very unicorn rainbow experience in the beginning that I didn't understand why I had so many people around me talking about how detrimental the public school system is. I'm like, huh, I don't know what y'all are talking about. Like I've had such yeah, a great you didn't experience. See it. I didn't yeah. see it. And then it started to decline and very fast. And it, what happened was I went from a very quiet mind my own business i i i do what i'm told i make sure like i'm i'm involved within the classroom and everything else i'm an involved parent but the moment that i had to do the smallest form of advocating the tone changed mm -hmm. and then i became the loud parent and i'm no longer i'm no longer viewed the same yeah. way so it's like okay we're now we're having small problems and it's not yeah. anything major and you're making it major so I, as it continued to snowball throughout the year, I was understanding the term of picking your battles because I'm not going to come in there guns blazing, expecting to get results, even through the abuse case, because it's not going to get me anywhere. Um, well, in our school, it's kind of funny because I'll hear, and although I'm a teacher, I'm rarely on the side of the school because I'm a parent first. Right. But you'll hear parents say, oh, you know, the school, not a lot, but you'll hear parents say, you know, the school talks about, oh, they want us involved. They want us to, to be here for our children. They want us to, but the minute we come in and, and suggest anything or offer anything, then it's like, you're a nuisance. Right. And I see that in the schools because there's already so much on everybody's plate. They kind of want a silent partner. Right. They want to say, oh, we, we welcome our parents in. But if you're a parent who challenges or wants any kind of a change you're a pariah because oh we don't want that kind of help we just want you to shut up and say oh yeah they include me yep. but we don't really want to hear your ideas right. because that means we have to do something in addition to what we already have to do Correct. and it's not everywhere and it's not every person but teachers generally and administrators feel like there's already so much on their plate they just want kind of a silent partner to, to be able to say oh we include the parents but it, it is tough and truly deep down in our hearts we want to help every child, but that requires even more effort and time and, and whatever. And it's easy for people to say, well, that's your job. You picked it. Yes. But when there's 35 kids out of like, I teach 170 and I might have 35 that are either ESOL, they speak English as a second language, 
or their reading level is four grades below where they should be, or they have Down syndrome, or they have cerebral palsy, or they have any number of other uh, uh, things going on. Getting to each one of them is an absolutely exhausting and pretty, pardon me for saying, damn near impossible mm -hmm. ask. And so when you go in and go, I need this for my child, although ideally in their heart they want to help, it's also a one more rock in the bag that they have to carry around. But that's their problem, it, you know. It, you know I, I've also, I've made it known and um, I'll continue to make it known. I'm still going to be that involved parent. Um, I'll make sure that you have everything that you need for, for success because in order for her to succeed and you to succeed, I have to be part of the equation. Yeah. Everybody, it's a team effort here. So I try to make sure that I set her up for success. Like for instance, um, I'll do like an about me thing on her. I'll give it to all of her team members, those who are on her right. therapy, everything. Um, about her, what works for her, what doesn't, because there's nothing worse than getting a new student and you know nothing about them 100%. or what works for them. 100%. So I'm gonna at least try to help out yeah. by providing stuff yeah. that works for her and that doesn't work for her. So everybody's gonna have like hopefully a, a good and that's, meshing. And that's, so, that's such a great thing to do because I know as a teacher, if I get any information from a parent, like if I email a parent and say, hey, I noticed this, 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 and they go, well, this student has this going on and this going and I go, okay, now I know. Instead of, and in my case, it might be a discipline issue more than a special needs issue, right. but rather than push this kid, if I know that his dad and his mom just got divorced and he's angry, I'm pushing him and being hard on him it's is not, not the help. right answer. Um, so, you know, whether it's, whether it's a prison model, as people say, where it's like, you know, authoritative or whether it's a hospital model where I nurse that that kid through the situation or whether it's a discipline model like that helps tremendously and sometimes like i i had a kid who wasn't showing up and bringing his materials to class well, what's going on what's going on and i was kind of hard on him you got to bring your stuff to class you're okay mr K. they never shared anything with me come to find out they had lost their apartment and they were like couch hopping his mom and three kids and i'm like oh no wonder and now i feel like a complete jerk and what example that kid that kid doesn't know whether I know or not, and they might be too embarrassed to share right. their needs. But now I go, oh, I'm, I'm a total heel. And people are quick to forgive you like, oh, well, you didn't know. Does that matter to the kid? Like, does that matter to Kendall that this teacher has never had a Down syndrome child before and doesn't know how to help her? So any information parents can provide to teachers or the school in general is is wonderful. That's like we had that actually where th this person was not only new to teaching, like first year teaching, it new to the diagnosis in general. So I tried to provide everything that can make their day and weeks, months set up for success with me doing that. You're still expected to do your job and I try to make sure that you understand that I'm thankful for you for doing that job because not everybody can do that job. Mm -hmm. I don't even want to do that job. Mm -hmm. So, but at the end of the day, no matter how much I do for you, please understand that I'm still a parent first. Yeah, that's right. So if it comes to the point where I got to advocate, it's not personal. No, I got to do what that's needs right. to be done for her. And unfortunately there were a lot of, um, clashing yeah. because people were taking things personal instead of me just stepping in and doing what a parent needed to do. This goes back to what I think <laughs> is a problem in society. I mean, I'm not, I could go an hour on this and I won't. I'll go about 30 seconds because we should move on. But people have lost the ability to disagree without hating each other. And by that, I mean, whether it's politics, whether it's um, you know, gender fluidity, whether it's death penalty, whether it's abortion, whether people have lost the ability to have a communication without saying, well, if you don't think what I think, I have to hate you. Right. And I'm the same way. I could, and I, I'm, it sounds like I'm, I'm tooting my own horn, so to speak, but I constantly say to my students, what we do in class is business. And that's different from personal. For example, I might get on you in class because you're throwing something across the room, but that doesn't mean I don't like you as a kid or as a person. Right. Like we have two relationships. When you walk by my room, I want you to say, hi, hey buddy, what's going on? Right. That doesn't mean I'm gonna let you get away with whatever you want in class, right. but that's business. And you're doing the same thing. You're saying, hey, look, 
as a teacher, I respect what you do. As a parent, I hope you respect my role. And we can clash. And that's okay. That's good. Um, we have discussions, just family discussions. And Logan and I will sometimes, you know, butt heads. He's at that age now. And I go, but this is good. And he's like, well, I hate that. And I'm like, no, it's good. You're flushing out your thoughts. I'm flushing out my thoughts. And somehow we're going to meet in the middle. But if you never have those conversations, everybody gets neglected. So it's awesome that you have that attitude. And I, as a teacher of 27 years, have a different perspective than a teacher of three years. Because a teacher of three years is still young, intimidated, and scared. I'm not young, intimidated, or scared. I understand. And I'm a parent. And I think I changed the most as a teacher when I, when I had my own kids um, because I became a parent first too. And once you have your own kids, you'll never blame a parent for being a parent first. Right. And that's kind of, so you also deal with young teachers who don't know what it feels like to have your kid placed in the hands of total strangers, especially a kid who's not as verbal as they might right. need to be to stand up for themselves, who can't come home and tell mom exactly right. what happened during the day. Right. And that's like Kendall's at. You turn her loose to these people. You're turning your child over to virtual strangers with no ability to know what happens to her for seven hours. Correct. And that is scary as hell. Yeah, that's right. And so you people, the teacher side needs to understand that. And if you don't have kids that you've ever had to turn over, especially kids... Who, I mean, turning over an, an average kid is tough. Turning over a kid who can't communicate, Logan was in that boat for a couple of years, who can't tell you what happened or what somebody said or did to them, that is scary. And so people need to understand that. Teachers do when they're dealing with parents of kids with special needs. I ask you to finish with a great story about Kendall. You made some jokes about funny things that happened. What is one thing that Kendall does that just melts your heart or makes you smile? or makes you um, just appreciate her the most? A favorite activity she likes to do? A favorite time you spend with her? I mean, she is the definition of, of a sour patch, um, but she... Meaning did, just that she's, she's always complaining? Sweet and, and sour, all, all, all the sour sweet okay. um, But. I've, she's Henri. She is. But she's smart and she knows what she's she doing. She knows what she's doing. She knows exactly what she's doing. But when she smiles, that, she's that's, adorable. That's what it is. So she has a tendency to, no matter what's going on, she recognizes emotion and she knows when the right time to come up and give you a hug and love on you, no matter what's going on, even if we just had the worst day. Um with her attitude, yeah, um, she can somehow sense. So, so you'll have that day where she just, mommy needs a hug, right? And she'll just come and sneak up, yep. crawl up on your lap, yep. put her arms around you, yep. And She's then, a doll and then you're like, man, I forgive everything you did. <laughs> I know you just terrorized the house. <laughs> yes, yeah, right. You're and now I'm like in a puddle, drew on the wall with crayons, <laughs> yeah. or, or or clipped the dog's hair, or whatever you did. But now all of a sudden. That's well, the, I will say this. So I've said this to a lot of people and I don't have a problem saying it to people on here. And I would love for them, like the people who watch, mm -hmm. um, if they have any questions. Yeah, reach out. Re reach out or even ask yeah. you. And then like, yeah, if you wanted to do a follow up, I'm yeah. fine with that too. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so. I'm sure there are people watching that either have a child or know of a child or relatives have a child. Yeah. <clears throat> She changed me for the better. And some people don't understand that if they didn't know me. I'm sure you can agree with this. Um, I wouldn't, I guess it would be like I had some growing up to do, but you don't fully understand how privileged people can be and what people can take for granted until you're in a situation where you're thankful for the small things mm -hmm. and you live life a little slower um, in a good way. So it's always, we got to reach this muscle. We need to do this and we need mm -hmm. to do this. Everything's off to the next stage and, and, and to the next goal and everything else. And while we still look for that, they're sweeter and they mean 10 times more when your child is able to accomplish that. Mm -hmm. um, and when you live on a slower rate, you appreciate life a little more than those who live in the typical world. Mm -hmm. um, 
because I don't think people understand that it only takes one instance, one split of a second for your life to be completely different. Yeah, I, I will share this with you, your sister especially. And I, she's just, because she's the mom, I think it's more intense for her. Like when Logan graduated high school, she sat there and bawled and she said, I just, I never knew if he was going to get here. Right. And although, you know, Kendall and my son are very different in their abilities and disabilities and challenges and whatever. You look at something and you go, man, you know, 80% of the world that has kids never has to even fight this. It seems like a burden that not the child is a burden, but the child's challenges become the mother's burden yes. and the father's burden. Yes. And so you go, man, how fortunate would it be to just not have, like, it seems like you'd look at a normal life and go for lack of a better term and go, oh, how much easier my life would be if my child was quote normal. Right. And to an extent true, although normal kids have their challenges as well. Right. But when you think of what most people like tying shoes or saying hello to a stranger or you go, that's just, that just happens for most people. For us, that's, that's a job. <laughs> that's a lot of therapy yeah, time. Yeah, it is. And <laughs> so, yeah, I think that's, that's great. That's great for people to realize, it. you know, be, be happy for your blessings. Right. And it's, it's, I'm, it's fun for me to see you and even having this conversation because we, we talk, but I don't know if we've ever talked this in depth, but about this particular topic, but knowing you since you were what, six, seven years old, six, seven years old, something like that. Um, back when we were counting rings on trees to determine how old the tree was, I was helping you with your homework. Um, you have handled, like, I'm really proud of seeing how you handle the challenge of having a child with Down syndrome. And like you put your daughter first, and that is the most admirable thing in my mind that a mom can do. So I want to congratulate you for, for advocating for her. And we didn't get into the legislation. We're kind of running out of time. Maybe we can do that another time. But okay. there was even some legislation you worked on in the state of West Virginia um, to advocate for um, Down syndrome children and, and their rights and, and abilities. So, um, but I, I think the last thing you said is wonderful, that in spite of all that, she can melt your heart just like any child. Yep. And she is, when she snuggles up to you or she gives you those big eyes or she put, you know, her beautiful hair, she's just adorable. So thank you for being open and like talking about very personal things because yeah. I know it's, you do because you advocate for it. So it's not something you, you shy away from, but also just something that's, that's a tough topic. So. Her, uh, her great story is uh, a great story of myself, of being a better wife, mother, spouse, mm -hmm. and human being yeah. so i mean she she is my business she is me she is yeah. every aspect of uh, the greater things that i want to do yeah so and it, and it, it changed your whole direction and what's your mission in life mm -hmm. yeah very good well let's move on i want to go to segment four we're going to end with something fun um and for those of you watching i know this isn't our word last week or this week isn't our typical haha -ha funny but I love this, and hopefully people enjoy watching and listening and learning. Um, but we're going to end with something funny. We're going to do a man-on-the-street interview. I thought it would be really funny. I got this idea last night to do a man-on-the-street interview with your sister. So as people know that watch the podcast, <coughs> Man on the Street is where I ask 10 tr uh, general trivia questions or general knowledge questions in different areas of a person. And then uh, my, the guest, the other person, usually it's Will. Today it'll be Sam. Uh, Sammy will try to pick her own sister. Now there's a 12 year age gap between the two of you. Sammy will try to pick her big sister's uh, knowledge here to know whether all you have to do is predict whether she got it right or whether she didn't get it right. Okay. And Sammy doesn't know the questions ahead of time. Um, but once she hears, what I'll do is I'll play for you the question. I don't know if you've heard the segment before. Yeah. What we've done. So, <clears throat> and Sammy's a big supporter of our podcast. So thank you for that. But um, I'm going to play for you. If I can find the folder here, I'm going to play for you your sister's questions, and then you're going to predict whether she gets them right or wrong. And in order to do this, you'll have to get five right to win. Same low okay. standard I had for baking. <clears throat> so no pressure, but here we go. 
Okay, everybody, we're here with another man on the street interview. In this case, it is a woman on the street interview. And this time I've decided to pick on my wife since her sister is a guest on the podcast today. So how are you, dear? Fantastic. Yeah, she's fantastic. She's doing this under protest. So I'm going to ask you 10 general knowledge trivia questions. I won't tell you if you got them right or wrong. And then at the end of the quiz, um, I'll reveal the answers to you. Well, what's going to happen is your sister's going to try to guess whether you get these questions right or wrong. So here we go. So that was our little intro. Here's <coughs> question one. Question number one. Where is the New York Stock Exchange based in New York? Now, I'll admit she looked at me quizzically, but where is the New York Stock Exchange based in New York? Now, the answer we're looking for is Wall Street, okay, because, you know, that's where all the stock exchanges are. So do you think your sister knows the answer of Wall Street? I would hope. Okay. Uh, is that a yes? Yes. Yes. Okay. I'm going to let you keep track of your rights and wrongs. Okay. There's a specific place in New York City where it's based. Wall Street? That is your answer, Wall Street. It's the New York She second Sure. Guess. She sure. second guessed herself. She did second guess herself, but she got <laughs> Wall Street and you predicted that. So you are one for one. Good for you. All right, here we go. Question two. Sorry, this is a little cumbersome on the computer getting around all these windows. Question number two. Who sang the song, All I Want for Christmas is You? Now, the answer is obviously Mariah Carey. And I feel like everybody in the world knows that. Does your sister know that? No. You're going to say no on this one? Yeah. Okay, here we go. Mariah Carey. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so you're one for one. All right. Here we go. Boy, she had no confidence in you. No, here. sorry, I did not. All right, here we go. Question three. Question three. A polygon with six sides is known as what shape? She's good at math, so yes. A polygon with six sides. Now that is a hexagon is the answer we were looking for. And here's the answer to question three. You predicting yes? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So your official answer is I don't know. I don't know. Okay. I was surprised at that. I think the word polygon threw her off, honestly. Okay. So you said, I forget, you said yes? Yeah. Or, okay, so you're one for three. Yeah. Okay. That's all right. You got one right so far. Question four. Here we go. <laughs> what weather tool is used to measure air pressure? What weather tool is used to measure air pressure. The correct answer is barometer. Will your sister know barometer? <laughs> this is your big sister. <laughs> <laughs> Will she know barometer? Um, I'll, I'll give her one. Let's see if she got it. So you say yes yeah, on this one? we'll All say right. it. All right, here we go. Barometer? All right. All right, so you got two. All right, question five. <laughs> I love this game. It's so fun. I don't know if you have an advantage or a disadvantage since you know the person so well. well like, I would yeah. think it would be an advantage, but these question, questions are random, and what people know is just hard to predict. Question five. Question five. What is the state capital of Montana? You know I want to retire there. <laughs> what is the state capital of Montana? So the state capital of Montana is Helena. I did not even know that. Montana. I'm not even afraid to say I didn't know that. That's okay. Will your sister know the state capital of Montana? Well, if she knows that you want to retire there, then I would hope she would know where it's at, right? I, I'm not going to give you any clues. Okay. Well, well, I'll lead you a little bit. She doesn't want to retire there. So she, anything your sister is not interested in, she generally doesn't put much effort into. So She's you take what you want. She's saying one ear and out the other. I'm just saying that she doesn't want to move to Montana. So you can take that into consideration or not. What do you call? Yes or no? How many do you have right so far? <laughs> Two. Two. Okay. Yes or no? One, two, three. Yes or yes, no? Yes, yes. Yes, she knows it? Yeah. Okay, here's her answer. I really don't like you. In case you couldn't hear at home, that is, I really don't like you. <laughs> and that is not the answer. 
I don't know. Ah, uh, she didn't know Helena. Uh, it's okay. We always throw in one one uh, That's cool. one state question. I'm not good at this. So you got two. It's okay. It's tough. All right, here we go. Question six. What is X worth in the following equation? X plus 12 plus 8 equals 30. X plus 12 plus 8 equals 30. Well, first of all, she's like math guru. Okay. So that's what I'm saying. She better know this. Okay. X is 10. The answer is 10 plus 12 plus 8 is 30. So X would equal 10. You say she knows it? Yeah. You have two right so far? Yeah. Okay, here we go. You're serious right now? X plus 12 plus 8 equals 30. Ten. X equals ten. And she got it. Good for you. That's three. She also has two kids who are currently <laughs> at the age of, of algebra. Of algebra. Yeah, guess who helps with algebra? Me. She doesn't help them with algebra. She's like, you're good at math. You do it. Okay. All right, here we go. Question seven. You need two more. We have seven, eight, nine, ten. You, have, you need half of what's left. Here we go. Good luck. Question seven. What word can go before the word decision, personality, and second? What? Yeah, that's a little tricky. What word can go before, what was it, decision, personality, and second? The answer that they were looking for in this question is split. Split decision, split personality, oh. split second. Will she be able to figure out split? Yeah. Okay. First? I don't know. First. First, second makes sense. First personality, I don't get. First split. But first and second is what she dwelled on. So she's, there you go. She's disappointing me. After question. <laughs> oh, gosh. <laughs> You're that, honey? Your own sister. All right, here we go. Question eight. You need, you need two out of three. Good luck. Question eight. According to legend, what was the name of King Arthur's magician advisor? So King Arthur's magician was Merlin. Will she know Merlin the magician? Well, considering she likes Mickey, Merlin was part of that. In Disney. Okay. Yes. Yes. I don't, I, you said your answer is yes. Yeah. I don't think Merlin is Disney. Well, he he in, was King Arthur or was Merlin part of Disney? Merlin, yeah, they had like a segment on that. Oh, did they? Uh -huh. Okay, well, let's see. Merlin. Yeah. All right. This is fun. It's coming down to the last two questions. You need one out of the two. Here we go. Question nine. Question nine. Are you nervous? A little bit, yeah. I know. <laughs> it's fun. It's a stupid game, but it's fun. Question nine. In which wing of the White House is the Oval Office located? She got it right. Okay. Yeah, I, I knew. I didn't select based on the fact that my wife was a congressional page <laughs> and knew, knows a lot about the government. I just picked the, the, the questions as they came in order on this website that I used. So you say yes on this yes. one? Yes. All right. The West Wing. The West Wing is the correct answer. That's where it is. So you win. You want to know why? You want to know why she the, better know the that TV answer? show too? No, no. not that. Why? Because she was a congressional page and worked at the Capitol. Yeah, that's what I, I said. So she worked there for a year. So she knows all about it. <laughs> she actually got to escort. She was one of the pages that got to escort President Clinton yep. to his first inauguration yep. when he got elected. So very cool. Um, so I got five. You got five. You win. But let's go for six. Okay. Here we go. Question 10. See if you can get a sixth one. Eek it out. So you're a winner. All right. Here we go. Question 10. Question 10. What is a baby kangaroo called? What is a baby kangaroo called? The answer is a joey. Will she know that a baby kangaroo is called a joey? No. No? Okay. Here we go. It's never good when it starts with a sigh. I should know this, she said. I forget. I don't okay. know. She forgot. I got six. You got six. You even beat my score of five in bacon. So good for you. Mm. Oh, my goodness. That was good. Well, thank you for coming by. I have a joke of the week that I always end with, a bad joke. Uh, today's joke is about a man who was recently married. 
you'll appreciate this because you like you like jokes when I tease. It says Tim decided to tie the knot with his long term girlfriend. After oh, one evening after the honeymoon, he was organizing his golfing equipment. For you, I should change it to hunting equipment, mm. probably, uh, since Michael's a big hunter. He was organizing his golfing equipment. His wife was standing nearby watching him. After a long period of silence, she finally speaks and says, Tim, I've been thinking, now that we're married, maybe it's time you quit golfing. You spend so much time on the course, you could probably get a good price for your clubs. She said, Tim gets this horrified look on his face, and she says, darling, what's wrong? He said, for a minute there, you were beginning to sound like my ex-wife. Yep. Ex-wife, she screams. I didn't know you were married before. And Tim said, I wasn't. <laughs> yeah. Well, Sam, thank you so much for coming in and doing the podcast. Mm -hmm. And hopefully people learned a lot about Kendall and other, other children with all special needs. Also, I learned a lot about baking. Thank you for preparing the quiz for me and for filling in for Will while he was gone. You're certainly um, much prettier and, uh, and, you know, fun to talk to. So thank you very much. And everybody at home... As I always say, try to ring the bell in YouTube. We're at 92 subscribers, I think. I'd love to get to 100. So spread the news and uh, have a great week. And hopefully we'll see you back with Will next week. So bye-bye, everybody. Thanks. See you later.